Good evening. Good evening. I hereby call this December the 11th meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. As always, I'd like to take a moment and thank all of our city staff. I'd like to recognize uh, those from our public safety departments to help to make uh, this happen every day for our citizens, starting with our city manager, Mr. Lee Garrity, from our public and the manager staff, forgive me, uh, Mr. Brow, uh, Mr. Page, Mr. Turner. Uh, we have Attorney Carmen here from our city attorney's office, also joined by our public safety attorney, Attorney Sykes. From our police department, we have Chief Thompson here with us today. Uh, Chief Mayo from our fire department was not able to make it, but he sent, uh, I think, an excellent replacement. Uh, Chief Harry Brown is here. Uh, thank you for joining us and all the fire staff. Uh, also, we have our Director of Emergency Management, Mr. Mill Sattler, with us. And thanks to everybody who helps to make this happen day in and day out. Uh, there are several items on the consent agenda. There are only two items on the general agenda. There is an item uh, regarding its an ordinance, establishing standards for the operation of trolley clubs. We have much discussion about that. And the second item is a resolution awarding a purchase order to integrated ballistic identification systems. Uh, items on the consent agenda are unanimously approved unless a member of this committee wishes it to be uh, pulled for consideration. Uh, members of the committee, are there any items on the consent agenda that should be pulled for discussion? Mr. Chairman, uh, there are a number of items here that deal with public conveyance, traffic, uh, trolley car, not trolley car, but taxi cab service, limousine service. Uh, rather than pulling each of those, could I simply ask the um, assistant city manager to elaborate on why, once again, we are looking at this as, as different categories. We don't regulate uh, uh, Uber, we don't regulate Lyft. Uh, the other sort of transportation systems, and yet we're spending a great deal of time and energy uh, looking at individual tra taxi cab companies and um, and limousine services. Could you just uh, could, would, would that be well, something? Mr. Turner? Before you speak, uh, if there is not a particular item on the consent agenda that needs to be pulled for the discussion, I would entertain a motion, and then with discussion we can discuss these separately. Yes, as, a, as an afterthought. That's fine with me. Right. Is, there, is there a motion on the consent agenda? Nothing to pull. Um, when I'm I'll make a motion to approve approval. Is there a second? Discussion. Uh, Mr. Larson. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, could you just elaborate a little bit on why we spend all this time looking at taxi cabs and limousines and don't look at Uber or Lyft as other systems? Certainly, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, the city council, has, city in general, has authority to regulate cabs by the state statute. The state, several years ago, took away the authority of the city to regulate services such as Uber and Lyft. So we operate cabs and uh, taxis for several different reasons. One, the city council has in the past wanted to assure some level of safety of both the vehicle, the company that provides that vehicle, and the driver who's operating that vehicle. So you have permits that you issue to the company a license, and then you have a permit that you issue to the driver of the vehicle. You also have inspection of the vehicles themselves in order to assure that they are safe and well and properly insured so that if an accident does happen that there's some liability coverage that can assist with the damages that that driver and vehicle may cause. Uh, other issues that the City Council has looked at and is concerned about with regarding these vehicles is or, or including things like what are the maximum rates that companies are allowed to charge. Companies can charge less than the rate the council sets, but the council has established a maximum fare that can be charged for tax. Um, there are also provisions in your ordinance regarding how drivers treat the passengers and how they park and operate the but in general, the purpose for the city to regulate the cab is in order to establish and assure some level of safety for the passengers and also to set rate maximum. Mr. Lawson. And as I understand then, um, we are not allowed to regulate Uber, or Lyft, or other agencies by state law. That's it correct. Pre prevents us from providing those same standards of regulation, of assurances, public safety, whatever the things that we're interested in. Is that's that correct? That's correct. So the public knows the difference. Yeah, thank you. All right, Council. Mayor Prosenberg. I just had to say, Mr. Larson brought this up. I noticed in the paper, or either, I don't want to read the paper out, it was on television, that one city has required their taxi drivers to dress neat. 
question that be put in that meeting. We do have some provisions about the appearance of drivers in our ordinance. Okay. So we can look at that and bring information <coughs> and details back to you. But we do have that provision. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Burke, I just want to mention also in the, the, the trolley pub discussion, that there is uh, language in talking about the type of clothing that they have to wear, okay. representing the name of the trolley pub as well. So. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get some sense from staff, maybe not, not certainly not today, but over time about the necessity of doing this on a yearly basis. I mean, the, the safety inspections are ongoing, right? You know, every year those have to be done. Driver background checks, that's an ongoing process. So is there really any benefit to coming back before council once a year to do this step? This is every three years for each company. It's every three years. And so we just have some that come in every year because their time is up. Okay. In other words, so they've it, applied at an odd year or between years, and so every three years they're they have to be renewed. How many taxi cab companies do we have? In <laughs> it seems like yeah, we see an awful lot on a regular basis. There's a dozen or so, and yeah. we have in excess of 200 certificates. Uh, and the market determines whether we have too many or too few, or correct. Whatever. One of the other uh, things the council could decide is to number of taxi cabs that you wish to have on the street. You do that and whenever you approve these, but the council has never decided that the system overall has a maximum capacity of X. You've always said let the market decide. Thank you. And Mr. Turner, if you will, what I'm hearing is if you could just maybe some time in January just bring us some information to this committee uh, on taxi cabs. This is an informational item, so we'll be familiar with it. And if we have any questions about how we operate and how we do things in terms of taxi cabs in the city, we'll address it at that time. Certainly, we've actually I've actually talked to Ms. McCullough, the transportation director, and she's planning on working on a primer on a few things for the committee. So I'll ask her to add that. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and second on the consent agenda. All in favor, please vote yes. Opposes, likewise, no. Uh, that is unanimous. The consent agenda is approved. Item G1, please. Item G1: Ordinance establishing standards for the operation of trolley pubs in the streets by the addition of Article 13 to Chapter 78. This item continued from September, October, and November meetings of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, you know we've had much discussion about trolley pubs in the city. Uh, we have got an ordinance in front of us for our consideration. Uh, that ordinance has been adjusted several times, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Turner, who will give us a little bit of information about some of the adjustments to the ordinance uh, regarding what we have here in front of us. Certainly, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as you recall, you had some concerns about certain elements of the previous draft ordinance things like, as the chairman I think has just alluded to, the appearance and dress of the operators of the vehicles, uh, non-motorized assisted pedal only vehicles, and whether they would be allowed. So we've tried to incorporate into the final version that we're submitting to you the changes that uh, are necessary to address the concerns the committee raised last month. Members so of the committee, are there any questions for Mr. Turner? Or any questions uh, regarding this ordinance in general? If there are no questions, uh, we've evaluated this thoroughly, then I would entertain a motion at this time. Motion to approve. We have a motion and we have a second. Yeah. All in favor of approving this ordinance, please vote yes. That is unanimous. This item will move to the full council on Monday at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Item G2, please. Item G2, resolution awarding purchase order for an integrated ballistic identification system. All right. Yes, I was looking for Mr. Bates, but you have the floor, madam. All right. Um, I am the firearms examiner for the Winston-Salem Police Department. My name is Allison Anderson, um, and I want to first thank you guys for letting me speak. Uh, I have a short PowerPoint, if you guys would like to use it, kind of a visual. Please. If you don't mind. So first, I just want to explain a little bit more about exactly what we're asking for. Um, this is the Integrated Ballistics Identification System, and it sounds like a, a lot, but essentially what it is is a, a mechanism for us to utilize in order to link crimes together without having to look at every single item of evidence. And it's much quicker, much faster, and it's a great method. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is when a, when a gun is fired on a scene of any kind, type, 
we get these uh, cartridge cases or shell casings, brass, how people may say, come out to the scene. Um, and these are what's collected, especially by forensics or other officers, in order for us to utilize this to link crimes or to look at the evidence that these cartridge cases hold. By entering these in a timely manner into the system, we will be able to like, immensely solve more crime by linking these. The same guns are doing mo most of this crime out in the uh, city. So by looking at, okay, the same gun is doing this crime, this crime, and this crime, we may have a small piece of ev or information from this crime, but nothing from this one, link them together, now we can solve all three of them. So that's huge. With my job in general, every firearm leaves unique marks on a cartridge case. So as you can kind of see in that picture, those little striations that are on those, that's what we're utilizing and that's what we're using with the system in order to figure out, do these, mar or do these match. And by using this, we can do immediate comparisons by putting it in this terminal as opposed to what I'm having to do, which is every, you know, look at every single cartridge case individually and compare them by eye. This is kind of letting a computer do it and it's making it a lot quicker in order for us to expedite solving these crimes quicker. And essentially, obviously, this will make a safer community. Mrs. Anderson, before we move to the next yeah. slide, uh, Councilmember McIntosh has a question. This may go yeah. way down a rabbit hole, but why is it that those, those strike marks are unique on each gun? So manufacturing. So during our training, what they actually really push is that we go and visit manufacturing plants. So we've gone to like Ruger, Smith & Wesson, and a lot of these manufacturing plants are these major gun manufacturers. And essentially, with the tooling methods that are used, well, how they make the firearms, leaves and impart these unique marks on every single fire or uh, on the fire components and that's how this whole science is able to be led into court systems and be utilized in order for us to solve the crimes does that help that's by, Councilman Lewis. That's by weapon type you know, Ruger or Smith and Wesson you can can you identify the actual gun itself or just gun type based on manufacturing some are unique so some uh, manufacturers do impart unique marks that kind of are proprietary to their actual uh, company. So there are ones that, yeah, I can pick up and say this is from this type of firearm pretty quickly. Uh, but then there are some that utilize the same as other companies. So you can narrow down the field, but you can't always give a definite on every single one. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case, uh, difference on that. But what you can do are so that without getting too technical, you got class characteristics and individual characteristics. The class characteristics are the ones that the manufacturing are actually saying, we're going to put a circular firing pin or we're going to put a square firing pin for this firearm. And those, the manufacturer saying, this is how we're going to make it look. The individual characteristics are the ones that are haphazardly <coughs> happening during the manufacturing process that are what we can use those striations. That's, those are the things we can use for the examination in order to say, this gun was, you know, fired, this cartridge case was fired, or this bullet, this bullet, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. So the system in general, it's a two-part system. We're looking at, it's a brass tracks, which is the enter, enter um, method, and then a match point, which is where you view everything. So how this essentially works is you're going to position the cartridge case into this holder. Then you're going to um, insert this holder into the automated system. The system does everything else pretty much by itself. So that's what makes it so amazing because these are linked for, to different um, machines all across the United States and the world. And so by having this being automated, you're not having one person who thinks, oh, I need this a little darker. This person's saying I need it lighter. It's all the same. So it makes the computer easier to read the results. As you can see, the photo processing part, that's kind of a, an image and a video of it doing all this stuff. So it takes all these images, they're 3D images, and then the system will assign an algorithm. Which don't even ask me what this algorithm is, but some mathematical equation. And that's what's going to give it to each of these cartridge cases. Then they're compared through all the other cartridge cases. And the algorithms are what they're looking at. They're not looking at the picture, the image, because that can be altered. It can be a little bit different. It's the algorithm that they're matching, which gets you the, the great results so high on the result um, so correlation search. So then you're going to send it over to the match point. And you're going to look through them, and you're only going to look at like the top 30. And that's where you can find your, so you're visually looking at them in order for you to find your possible matches. 
And what we're going to be able to do is by having this in-house, we're going to be able to issue out potential leads to detectives and to investigators really quickly, which is going to give them that little bit. I mean, I know people joke about the first 48. There's a lot of validity to that because if you're going to wait too long to get results to somebody, it's just going to go cold. And so this is what's going to get this, the results out faster. So it's no surprise, um, just the upsetting that there are higher firearm stats in the past couple of years and gun crime is rising. And I think that that's what makes this so important is we haven't really been focusing on this so much, but now is the time where we really need to hit this hard and try to get this, these gun stats to go down. So essentially, because of the awesome bond funding we got from the city council and everything, we have the space for this. We never had the space before because we were in such a small area. We didn't have this amazing um, new building at the Alexander R. Beatty Center. And so by having the space, we actually have a room dedicated already to this um, piece of equipment because this was always in the plan to do. And then we're just hoping that we can get this in there sooner than later to be able to start getting it in action. Essentially, why do we need this? I think I've already kind of explained that. Um, we are extremely backlogged as it is right now with getting these casings in because we're having to go to other locations. By having it in-house, we'll be able to get these things in 24, 48 hours and have results back to officers almost immediately. And essentially, that's just going to help everything speed up. Like I said, the 48 hour, 28 or 24 to 48 hour turnaround, daily entries. The, the key thing is the comprehensive database. A lot of people are like, well, just because I put in the homicides. Well, that's not where you're going to get your hits. You got to get your homicides are going to hit to your discharging firearm where maybe they got lucky and they didn't hurt somebody that time. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take each crime and put the same amount of weight on all of it because you got to have a database, a comprehensive database, in order to be able to say these homicides are linking to this small crime, which a lot of people will talk about small crimes. They'll be like, oh, yeah, this happened. And they'll, they'll sing like a canary, but they won't say anything about the homicides. So that's where you can really solve the crime because you have this information right there in front of you and essentially making a safer community. Any questions? Do you have how many? Well, if, just to make sense, just quickly, how long do you think it'll take us to work through our, our backlog? So my plan is to start fresh. If you sit there and dwell in, in the past, you're going to constantly dwell in the past. So by hitting it head on the, the day we get the terminal, if we can get the terminal, is we're going to start with current, current, current. And um, with that, we're going to build, but we're going to eventually run out of stuff to put in for current. That's when we're going to start pulling in the backlog. So I think it's key to start fresh, start with what we have right in front of us, and kind of slowly pull in that. And that's where it just depends on who we can kind of pull in, because right now we have I'm the firearms examiner, and then we have one who's in training right now, so she's still not taking casework. Um, but really, this is something I, anybody can do. It's very simple. And like I said, the machine does it all for you. So by getting people in here, like light duty, or you know, officers who are not able to work because I mean, we have lots of pregnancies in our division, so we can get those people who aren't really supposed to be out on the streets, they can sit here and enter, and we can get a lot of this stuff put in quickly. And that's going to be my goal, is to uh, kind of get people trained on a temporary basis to just enter these things in to get them done quickly. Councilman Larson. Oh, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, we all watch CSI, you know, and you guys. So what, um, who's doing this now? Where, where, do you, where do we send our casings to get an assessment, or do we at all? Are you just... Yes, so me and my other partner mm -hmm. um, in the firearm section are both trained for entry. Right. Uh, so we are going to the Greensboro Police Department in order to enter them. But Greensboro Police Department is also letting High, uh, yeah, High Point, Burlington, Guilford County, a lot of other mm -hmm. agencies into there. Mm -hmm. So to get a spot, a time mm -hmm. slot, mm -hmm. is not is almost, you're lucky if you get one once a week. Mm -hmm. And so it's just not feasible to sit here and continue to drive 30 minutes to go put this information in when we could be doing it on a daily basis within 24 hours. We have, we have a better police force than Greensboro does, so we, we, <laughs> we, we, should, we should be able to handle that. What is the annual operating expense on this? Because it's obviously fairly high tech and requires calibration and whatever, I'm yes. sure. So what, what do we anticipate as, as sort of a operating? It's a 23000 right. um, 
And essentially, it's, it's also the, the tech and the maintenance fee, but you also have to remember you're paying for that secured ATF line. Right. right. And that's what's key because you're linking to all these other agencies. Right. And without that, then we're just looking at crime inside of Winston-Salem. And yeah, that, that's good. It'll still help. But to be able to link out to other places is where you really get your... So, so on, your, on your chart, you said that on an annual basis, we processed how many cartridges? How many cases? Oh, I can go back to that. It's like 1,200 or something? What was that figure? Yeah, so uh, 12, 12 these are fees. Yeah, so on a, you know, this is kind of the past three years, and this is obviously up to November. Yeah. Um, that's how many casings yes, we are seizing in the city. A year. Yeah. And so I haven't done the math, but you divide that by how many days you're working, and you're processing a lot of cartridges every day. Yes, you are. Yeah. Now, I will say that we are not also entering all of those, because if we can get on a crime scene and you have 20 on a crime scene, what we do is it's, it's an ATF approved methods of triaging, which you're looking at them and you're only putting a few in as long as you can tell that they have the similar characteristics. Because if you put too much into that system, you're going to clog it up and it's going to be super slow. <clears throat> Mrs. Anderson, I'll, I'll say I was extremely impressed with your presentation. I was also impressed with uh, the number of pregnancies that are in your department. <laughs> and, and I made a conscious it's decision to stay away. Real life. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with Mr. Larson. I think certainly our police department is better than Greensboro. I, I, th I think we have the best <laughs> fire department in America, and we have the best police department in America, and my favorite department is usually the one that I'm talking to at the time. <laughs> so since I'm talking to you, we, we, I think this makes sense, and we should do what we can to provide you with what you need to expedite justice and serve the people of this community. And I think we're almost close to a motion, but I think we have a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. McIntosh. Uh, have, did I you want to speak, Mayor Brooks? No, I was going to put a motion on the floor. Oh. Oh. Okay, well, <laughs> two quick comments. The, um, it's, it's noteworthy that from 2015 to 2017, it's almost been a 100% increase in the number of shell casings. And I'm assuming that has something to do with the type of firearms being used to some degree. But then I also want to go back to something I've spoken about quite often, which is using technology to, to sort of multiplex our human talent. Um, this, to me, seems like a, a case of being able to get a lot more work done without having to hire a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and the people that using the people that we have to get more done. So this to me is a you know, perfect matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any discussion? Yes, I would like that. May I approach him, Bert? After you conclude this, all this hard work that you're going to be doing in a rush, please give us a report. Mr. Chairman, don't you think we need to give a report? I certainly agree. How long does it take for the equipment to be? 120 days is what the manufacturer is telling us. Probably need about a, six months to a year before we really can have a lot of, a lot of data to show you. Okay, six months is not enough. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Great. Thank all you right, so all much. in favor, please vote yes. Opposes, likewise. That is unanimous. Thank you. That'll move to Monday. Is there anything else that should be brought to the committee's consideration for the good of the order? I, I, yeah. I, I heard through the wind that Chief Thompson uh, had some uh, adjustments to his staff. I think I had to hear it from the streets, but Chief Thompson, you have the floor, ma'am. Congratulations to everybody. <laughs> Chairman Taylor, Mayor Pro Tem Burke, Vice Chair McIntosh, and Council Member Larson, um, thank you for having us here tonight, and thank you for the, uh, the vote on, on the IVIS system. Um, I just want to share with you all and ask that you join me in congratulating some of the newest um, promotees to our command staff. Um, recently promoted um, Captain William Penn. You're here. Captain Penn spent the last several years working as a lieutenant in our um, Vice and Narcotics Unit. He is now the commander over District 1, and um, we're happy to have him as one of our, our command staff members now. Right. Congrats. Um, Captain Steve Tolley. Steve Tolley. <laughs> Captain Tolley spent the last year as a patrol lieutenant, but the prior three or four years um, he spent as the lieutenant in the Criminal Investigations Division. He has a strong background in investigation as he's worked in both uh, CID, Criminal Investigations, as well as Special Investigations Division. Um, and he will serve as the commander, or he is serving, as the commander 
um, over the Criminal Investigations Division. Uh, so He's Catherine the smooth Collins guy that gets to wear the suits on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Suit, yeah. <laughs> And I must say, uh, this morning he's been very busy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Appreciate your service. And last but certainly not least, the newest member to our executive command staff team, and that is um, Assistant Chief Natasha Miles. <laughs> Assistant Chief Miles for the last four years have been the commander or captain over the District 1. Um, and she will now serve as the, the uh, Bureau Commander over Support Services Bureau. And so we're happy to have her. As such, um, Assistant Chief Bricker, who was not able to be here tonight, he had been the commander over the Support Services Bureau. He is now over Investigative Services. Um, and I want to also recognize another member of my command staff, and that is uh, Captain Chris Lauder. Here, here. Love it. Hey, Chris. Thank you all, and we look forward to, uh, to working with you. Thank you, Chief. Councilmember McIntosh. Yeah. You go first. I, I have to say that when I found out that um, Captain Miles was leaving us as District 1 Commander, I, um, I had a little bit of anxiety. And I think I speak for Councilmember Adams as well. Um, her phone number's plugged into mine. I speed dial her in a heartbeat and, and don't hesitate to do so. Um, but having met um, Captain Penn, I have, uh, I have no qualms that I think He's going to fill those shoes, and we're going to get along fine. And he's going to probably hate seeing my number come up on his phone so often. <laughs> but there you are. But thank you, both of you. Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Yes, I'm, I congratulate all of you. And I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, but Captain Penn, I could be just like his mother. <laughs> oh, my God. I happen to be in the uh, post office, and he was off duty. And uh, he spoke very nice. and. I had my cell phone on, I don't have to know how to work. And I said to him, would you mind getting my phone right for me? And he said, yes. And I said, now, now who are you again? And he said he was Penn, Captain Penn. Well, Captain Penn grew up in North, North Hampton, known him from a child. And I saw his mother not long ago. Mm -hmm. And she was beaming like I don't know. She was so proud first time. And it makes all of us feel good to see that we have men and women. Some grew up in this city. Some came to this city. But they want to take care of us. And I pray that God continues to bless you. And I thank you for what you do when you sometimes go a little bit farther to make people comfortable and happy. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all. All right. Uh, that, that concludes our agenda. And I'll just say Captain Penn as a gentleman from the from the south side, I won't hold where you were born and raise that against you, okay? <laughs> all right. Thank you all for what you do for our community, those who are recognized, those who are not. If there's nothing else that should be considered for the good of the order, we consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>